Hey, so um, for the social business uh, approach, the, we're going to cover Pollock and Warwick, um, the so-called business solution to poverty. And uh, um, as I said, there's another um, book that's covered in the textbook, and that's the one by Prahalad, um, which predates um, this book. So social business some t is, is sort of the general field. Social entrepreneurship, people think of more as like smaller, you know, like one person or a group of five or 10 people starting a social business um, and, and with an emphasis on innovation. Some people call this social enterprise. So there's a number of names in the literature for this. Um, so in this basic approach, the question is, is can we make money or profits and have a social impact, some kind of social benefits at the same time? This is the so-called double bottom line. So the bottom line in the business model is, is what's the profit? You've got income and expenditures, take the difference, what's the profit? So the idea here in a sense is, is to say, I want to invest in a business, start a business, run a business that's going to make me money and going to have a positive impact on the poor, for instance. Okay. Um, some people uh, also explicitly include the environment in this, and sometimes that's referred to as the triple bottom line. So help fix the environment, have social impact, make money at the same time. Okay, um, so this is sort of the business person's perspective. So remember where we've been. We development economists. We covered you know a number of different perspectives there, and we did health, we did education. Now we're on business. So everybody's got a different perspective about how to approach um, this problem. In a sense, the social justice chapter had another set of ideas. It was. A lot about how to end poverty. A lot of it was rights-based, and you know, in, injustices, so forth. Religious views of how to end poverty, um, secular views, philosophies. So we're really covering a very wide range of perspectives. There's probably truth in every one of the perspectives um, we've covered to some extent, at least. And it's my, my approach here is to cover the diversity and let you decide, because there's no one recipe, essentially, um, for for taking on such a significant challenge. Okay, so the people involved here, um, uh, Paul Pollock um, started a few different uh, companies associated with development. Um, he's a psychiatrist. Um, and uh, Mal Warwick, he's an entrepreneur and impact investor, as he says. Um, so this is the title of their book um, is Business Solution and Ending Solution to Poverty, Designing Products and Services for Three Billion New customers. This is also partly based um, today on Paul Pollock's um, initial book from a few years back called Out of Poverty. There are some ideas that sort of made it into the new book and some ideas that did not make it into the new book. Okay, um, And uh, so the, these are the people, um, you know, people's perspectives we'll, we'll be uh, talking about. Um, so they're asking questions from a business perspective. They look at the traditional markets in the developed world and say, are you going to really get growth? Are you really going to be able to expand your company, make more and more money, or is this market saturated? Okay. So should you consider the so-called emerging markets? Those aren't necessarily the markets um, at, for somebody less than a dollar or two a day. Those are markets. Usually an emerging market would be a place like Brazil. Okay an emerging market. Um, social entrepreneurs. Well, there are issues with a social entrepreneur. Can they find investors in what they're doing? And uh, they raise some concerns about that. He, they feel that the field of social entrepreneurship or social business needs to come unstuck. They spend a fair amount of time talk about, in the book criticizing the approach to social business. Past work. Of course, they've got all the solutions to the problems. Okay, so you, you can read this with some skepticism. Um, their claim is that Prahalad's examples of social business all failed. 
Now, if you read Prahalad, we're talking about a lot of social businesses all over the world. They said, except for one, some place called uh, Jaipur Foot, um, which is a prosthetics company in uh, India, and uh, they say that's still successful. Um, and they try to say, well, why is it that all of those failed? Okay, um, they said that for the large, for the most part, it was companies trying to adjust their existing products or services, and then apply them in the developing world context. And so that just didn't work. Um, and the claim they make is that Prahalad was focused on the $5 to $10 a day people. So if you read Prahalad, you know, it's, it's confusing because they always talk, in Prahalad, the big thing is the bottom of the pyramid. Okay, so that's 80% uh, of the people in the world uh, below $10 a day. Okay, um, and, uh, but they never say where they're at on that pyramid. Now, Pollock and Warwick claim they were focusing on the $5 to $10, okay? And they say, bad area to focus, okay? Uh, they didn't give a good justification for it, but they say, we feel we need to go to less than $2 a day, that group of people. Um, their comments on anti-poverty -pro professionals, um, they're facing an ongoing um, funding problem and proof of impact challenges. And that's true, I mean, if you think about the aid agencies, you know, they're, they're giving out money to very, all kinds of NGOs and different organizations around the world, and they're, they're continually writing proposals to get more money. And I, I really, you know, s sympathetic with that because that's what we do here at Ohio State, right? We're writing proposals to try to get money to support student trips or whatever else we're doing. And, and you know these guys are saying, forget that. St turn it into a business and make it support itself. Second, it's also very hard to show that you're having impact. This is a pretty frustrating thing. You go on a trip, you spend all your time, money, and uh, uh, energy, and you walk away and you're like, well, how do we know we had an impact? Now you can come up with a bunch of anecdotal evidence on the plane ride back, you can have discussions, and you can sort of convince yourself, but then how do you know that you, the impact lasted for a year or two, for instance? And uh, if you're modest about it, it sometimes is pretty eye-opening. Um, next, um, they're concerned with a market-based approach a bit about as capitalistic approaches have often exploited poor people and damaged the environment. Well, no kidding. Um, you know, the, the history of corporations isn't so sweet um, in terms of uh, exploiting people. Just look at what's going on in sweatshops even today um, and what has happened to the environment um, because of this uncaring attitude over history towards um, the environment. So there's been a lot of problems. They acknowledge that. Then they um, also talk about this idea called um, design for the other 90%. So that's, it's a very simple idea. It just says, um, you know, 10% of the world's rich, um, engineers and technology and all this should be designing for the other 90%, okay? Well, that's what this whole course is about, really. Um, so what's the mark, so why is this good business? He's, they're trying to write this for the hard-nosed business person, and I wanna say, why is this good business? Okay, so how many people are we talking about um, making less than $2 um, per day? Well, there's 2.7 billion people. That's why they use the 3 billion number on the title of their book. Okay? So there's purchasing power. I mean, it's a simple multiplication, right? You take uh, X percentage of $2 a day, whatever that is. Let's say it's uh, 10%, whatever it is. Multiply it by that big guy, that big number, and suddenly you're talking about a lot of money. All right? In other words, the idea is you don't make a lot of money from a few people, you make a little money from a lot of people. Very simple idea, right? Okay. Um, and they say that the, the markets in the developed world are all crowded, it's way too competitive, um, and that you really can't overlook these markets. Um, so the, their claim is that there is a growing interest within big business to, to move down market, as they're saying. Um, um, you know, talking about merging markets and things like this. 
They feel that the next step is to go down to the $2 a day crowd, the 2.7 billion people, and develop businesses that will make money from them, okay? And then the question is, is will they also then have a good social impact on them, okay? Um, <clears throat> There is, they acknowledge there's an issue of access to scarce resources, but they say people, poor people live next to some of the greatest world resources and we need to help, their help to gain access to those resources, like fresh water. Now when you read this part, the book is uh, rather confusing at points. It's sort of, sort of like you start to get a feeling that it's contradicting itself. Uh, a slide or two ago, it talked about concern for the environment. Well, this is saying, there's these fantastic resources. We got to go talk to locals so we can exploit those resources. That's what, what they're saying. I mean, I'm quoting here. Okay. So you could raise uh, some concern, but they do have a point here. Um, some locations that you go to in the developing world are just resource rich and just beautiful. I mean, they're, they're fascinating areas. Um, so what they want to do is utilize mainstream capital markets to fund large-scale global enterprises. We, they are not talking about the social entrepreneur model here. They're talking big business. I mean, really big business. They're going to define it here in just a minute. And they say, um, and the reason I put it in bold is I want you to remember this little piece. They want to solve problems with clean water, renewable energy, affordable housing, health care, education, jobs. They want to essentially do it all with business, okay? Their main message, and I quote it because you gotta keep in mind, this, this is their basic statement. This is one of the main statements of the book. So the, the goal, you start a company as a social business, you should have a 10 year goal of building a customer base of at least 100 million people, okay? Achieving revenues of 10 billion or more per year. Big company, right? Big company and realizing sufficient profitability to attract both indigenous and international commercial investors while minimizing its environmental impact to the greatest extent possible. Well, we're gonna come back to this, but uh, I will tell you that this is one of the only times where, so, see, what they're, you gotta read this very carefully. It says we're gonna attract indigenous and international commercial investors, okay? So, Ask yourself the question. Go read the book. Ask yourself the question, where is the company going to be? Is it going to be right here in the U.S., in Europe? I think the answer is pretty clear where it's going to be. You know, it's not, they're not going to station it next to Chino's house. Okay? I mean, it's pretty clear where this is going to be. Um, whoops. Next. They play a lot of hype on this notion of zero-based design, and this is essentially start from scratch design. And they say these are the eight keys to ending poverty. Listening, okay? You got the poor person who's a customer, listen to what they're saying. You're gonna design a product for them, you wanna make money off them, you better listen to what they want. Just like with Apple, you can imagine the market research they do. You come up with this phone, it's unbelievable. They need to know what we want so that this baby sells. They're saying the same thing here. We don't the others tell what the poor people want. They want to transform the market. In other words, don't, you gotta think in a way as well, there's no market here. Well, create the market so you can make a lot of money. Um, scale, designing for scale, they're saying hit 100 million customers, okay? You, you gotta be big. Affordability has gotta be um, there. Um, they're, they're saying like, you've got to be less than 10% of a product in the developing world for sure, okay? And you have to have very efficient business or you're not going to be able to keep your costs low enough so these people will be able to afford what you're trying to sell them, okay? Private capital. Well, they say if you are going to get private capital, you know, the rich of the world to invest in these things, you are going to need to have a profit margin. You're going to be able to, you're going to have to be able to give them profit back. Because, of course, if they can invest and get 10% on their money somewhere else, they're going to do it. Right? The, the, the investors here, this is a very important point. They need to be making their money or this isn't going to happen. Um, the last mile distribution problem is, is a big issue. Um, if you think about it, one of the biggest issues with delivering a broadband internet 
around the U.S. is the last mile problem. It's simple to run to a neighborhood a, a fiber optic cable or something, but get, if you do the economic analysis, getting it to go to every house is really expensive, actually. That's a last mile problem for the internet. That last mile problem, you know, you can take a bunch of stuff and dump it somewhere in a country, but how do you get it out to the people when it's rural? You know, that's very expensive. And he says, you have to use the locals to do that. Aspirational branding. Well, convinced to buy. You got He's talking about various ideas to advertise to people, even in markets that don't have TV, etc. You've got to come up with ways to hype it up and make the sale. That's what's happening to us all day, every day, right? We're getting all this stuff thrown at us. Buy this, do this. He's saying you got to do that too. Um, Jugad innovation, the fancy Indian name for tinkering. Okay, it's tinkering. That's all it is, tinkering. Um, we're going to come back to this issue in a little bit. Next, the customer. They say only business can end poverty. Well, so the poor are just trying to get by. They say you have to understand that. Uh, poor li receive little new news. Uh, they, they might have word of mouth or perhaps radio. They don't travel, so they're not exposed to new ideas and opportunities. So if you're going to market to them, you got to get out to them. Okay? Um, they have, few, they have very few choices for education or health care or all of this and the legal system. And they live with misfortune never far away. So uncertainty is personal and immediate. So think of Banerjee and Duffalo. This is a high risk situation. Uh, their income is irregular and unpredictable. We've talked about that quite a bit. So um, they say, well, outside top-down approaches don't work. Well, everybody knows that. I mean, the, what the UN did, or the World Bank did for many years, of these, these distant solutions that were sort of airlifted into the villages, is well known not to work, okay? And they just re-emphasize that. They say true development, that is community-wide changes, comes almost exclusively through the mechanism of the market, you know, buying and selling products and services. So the problem I have with this book is there's a lot of claims with, it's not a scholarly book, period. I mean, there's not a lot of justification for some of their claims, so it, it's very hard to assess the truth of the matter like this one, okay? I, I frankly can't assess it. Pollock, in particular, has quite a bit of field experience, okay? So I don't think these, these comments are coming from nothing, but uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, they say giveaways breed dependence and self-doubt instead of change and say we can't don our, or donate our way out of poverty. Of course, you know, William Easterly would disagree. Remember one of his proposals. Let's try giving cash to the poor. That's a giveaway. Okay? So, so don't think that others will agree with them on that point. Um, they say that traditional approaches are simply no good. Um, and, and even if you've got a good approach, they, their claim is there's not enough money to support it anyway. Okay? But they do backpedal a little bit. They say, but in public health and primary education, the official efforts have undeniably borne fruit. Well, you're talking about that 90% number, completing primary education worldwide, boys and girls. And that, that is incredible. Um, and they say it's undeniable the percentage of the world's people living at or below the substance levels declined during more than 60 years, okay? And we saw that when we discussed the Millennium Development Goals. <laughs> this is Paul Pollock loves saying this. He said this in his original book. Poor people themselves tell us that the main reason they're poor is they don't have enough money. What, what a smart aleck comment. I mean, that, that's Paul Pollock. I mean, that's his personality coming out. Well, why are you poor? Well, I don't have enough money. <laughs> so, uh, um, in, his, in his first book, it was interesting, though, in the con this, this, this remark, he, he justifies this remark by saying, okay, well, how do we get more money? And what he emphasized in his first book was, let's teach them how to be business people. And that made a lot of sense. I mean, that part of his book really resonates because, you know, if you think about it, we think about it as engineers, we want to teach them technological capacity to solve their technical problems. If he's a business person, well... Teach them business so they can start and run businesses. That makes a lot of sense. Okay? This kind of tone is gone from the, this book we're talking about now. Okay? He's talking about 
B. Okay. Um, so large-scale rich nation efforts um, use indirect methods, trying to enhance economic environment to grow the GDP, providing infrastructure. Remember SACS talking about the importance of infrastructure. Large foreign aid. Think of SACS. Think of the criticism of William Easterly about the big push um, and exporting our goods and services to them. Uh, if you, that, that one homework problem on uh, can we end poverty, okay, I, I didn't assign it because one, the one part's kind of long. The movie's like an hour and 40 minutes, but it's a, it's a really a nice movie. It talks about the importance of international trade and making fair trade, okay. Um, there's a lot of us selling to them rather than allowing them to sell to us, okay. Um, he says in all of these uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, INGOs, international non-government organizations, community, okay, whatever. But they, he, he basically says, they're having no impact. I mean, they, some of the people reading their book, I'm sure are pissed off. They're upset. Because they're saying they're having no impact. There are 29, the World Bank says there's 29,000 NGOs in the world. Okay? I mean, come on. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, I think it's a quarter of all aid is coming from NGOs in the world. Um, so, and then I, he, they took the step of, of criticizing Paul Farmer. Dr. Paul Farmer, was the, I mentioned him in the beginning as a quote in the um, social justice chapter. He's done, he has the Partners in Health program, um, which is widely acclaimed. Uh, it's, it's not just in Haiti, but other places, but a lot of his work's been in Haiti. Um, and he criticizes his program. He just, he rips it, he reams it. And it's sort of like, you know, what's, why? Because it's not a business model. Paul Farmer's not getting rich. That's essentially what the book is saying. So they're criticizing it. So they spend a lot of time criticizing other people. Microfinance, this was an interesting part of the book. Um, they say there's some successes, but they say Grameen Bank and Brack loans are not used to start businesses. Well, that, that seems to be largely true because those loans are very small. You know the Grammy Bank we saw on the Living on One Dollar? It was like a low amounts of money. It's it hard to start a business on. Um, and they're used to avoid starvation or pay for religious ceremonies. Their claim was it's greater than 90% are not invested in business. Then they raised something more that was um, that is a little surprising. I had heard about before, but so it says evidence is quickly mounting that many for-profit providers as well as some nonprofits engaged in the $70 billion microcredit industry. This is a big industry in the world, okay? Practice fraud, demand usurious interest rates. If you're not familiar with the, usury means it's like a money lender, you charge, some, somebody really needs a little bit of money, so you charge them, you give them the money, but you charge a really high interest rate, all right? So they're, they're uh, some of these interest rates, and these are microfinance institutions, are charging like on par with the money lenders in the streets. And at least um, two celebrated cases have made huge fortunes for their investors at the expense of their clients. Ew, that's kind of depressing, right? So realize the largest social business in the world is what? Microfinance. And they're saying there's big cheaters. In other words, the double bottom line, you're supposed to get profit and social impact well, they sort of say it's, it's really tempting, right? Start making more and more money, have less and less social impact. These people are exploitable anyway. And they do it. This is real, okay? Now, I don't know what percentage of the time that's happening. I know Muhammad Yunus spoke out against the, the group that did this, um, that was in Latin America, actually. But the point is, is that you know, you've you got you to gotta be suspicious here because this is, we're talking about capitalism here. We're talking about making money. And then out of the goodness of someone's heart, they're going to say, okay, we're going to lower our profit market and have social impact. The question is, is, will that happen? Okay? We'll come back to that. Next. Results of this uh, microfinance, they say, program is you get debt-ridden poor people a case in India where a wave of dozens of suicides brought on by aggressive debt collectors. Ooh. I mean, you understand that you know you take out a loan and then you, it's a microfinance institution, they have to be paid back. And if you're starving, you can't pay back, right? 
And then he's, you know, you're sending out the people, and you're, and you don't know how tough they're going to get, you know, the thugs or whatever to get the money back. What's going to happen? Um, and they also claim that the microcredit claims are overblown with respect to development. Well, that's interesting because Benergy and Duffalo essentially said the same thing by studying it scientifically. I trust Benergy and Duffalo much more. Where they make the statement, it's, it's sort of like, really? Well, it sort of validates what Benergy and Duffalo are saying, too. It's, maybe it's useful. Benergy and Duffalo were sort of like, yeah, it kind of seems to be working. It should be pushed forward. Okay? I mean, they, they were supportive of it. But they weren't, like, excited. They wouldn't say, too, that it was overwhelmed. So they, they feel that they need better screening of applicants, and the loan amounts should be um, increased because they're not enough. Um, and then they go on, and then they just like piss everybody off in the whole field of social business and social entrepreneurship. And they, they, they criticize, they say all organizations associated with the Aspen Network on development um, entrepreneurship are having no real impact, period. Go to that website and look at about the number of organizations you're talking about. It's incredible. This is a big, big group. And they say they're not having any impact. So I don't know how Aspen, the Aspen group felt about that. So then they go on and say, why is business best for development? They say profitable business attracts substantial capital. So what they want, they, they have this vision of a company that can get a lot of investors to bring to bear on trying to solve, you know, Problems for the poor in the sense of providing them products that they want, that they're going to buy. Nobody's going to force them to buy them, of course. So, that, you know, Pollock and Warwick say, well, if they don't want to buy them, they don't want to buy them. We've got to make good enough products so they will buy them. So in a certain sense, it's okay. Successful businesses hire lots of people. Well, the question is, is where are those people being hired? And they don't really address that in the book. It seems to me the way the book is worded and the way things are going is those people will be hired right here in the United States. And some locals to handle the last mile distribution. Um, successful businesses are capable of reaching scale. This one is hard to argue with. Um, if you go on one of your project trips, uh, let's say you go to Guatemala in the summer and you, you've got a solution just is awesome. Or one of your projects in this class is just awesome. You implement it somewhere, Ethiopia, Nicaragua, whatever it is. You know it's going to work somewhere else. Does it happen? Jeff Sachs says, no, it's not happening. We have good solutions. Nobody's scaling them up. So you say, well, I'm going to scale up by writing a proposal to UN or World Bank. Well, this scale up may or may not happen. So Pollock and Warwick said, there's only one other option. You got to start a business. You got to sell it. Okay, so... This is a tough issue. Scaling up is really, really important. We'll come back to that later on in chapter four. Um, they say that businesses bring together the expertise in design, financial management, marketing, and other fields that are not found in the aid organizations. In other words, they're not, just, they're not equipped to do it. NGOs aren't typically equipped to do it. Um, they're less influenced by political pressure. They view that as a good thing. I look at it and say, well, that may be a bad thing, right? Um, what happens with businesses in the developing world? Who do they ally themselves with? The rich, the oligarchy, the dictator, right? Um, so profitable businesses stimulate economic growth in communities where they do business. Well, you know, there could be some truth in that if they have the last mile distribution and they start some businesses. I mean, if you think about the importance of jobs, I mean, it's crucial, right? Humanitarian engineering, in a sense, without... Um, social business component without that really isn't addressing one of the basic issues and that is the, the, the issue of job creation. I mean, and uh, you know, you, this field can be criticized for that. That's why humanitarian engineering often teams themselves with social entrepreneurship to try to get at this issue. Um, next. Uh, then there's the Don't Bother Trilogy. Um, if you're not talked to at least 100 customers in some depth, don't bother. Well, that makes sense, right? You do that in the United States. If your product or service won't earn or save three times the customer's investment in the first year, don't bother. In other words, sell products where poor people will get a return on their investment. Okay. Seems wise. 
Um, if you can't sell 100 million of your product or service, don't bother. Wow, that'll throw out a lot of stuff, right? 100 million. Next, what do investors look at? They look at um, ratio of debt to equity. All right, how much your enterprise has to pay back to lenders compared with the amount you received in exchange for a piece of the auction. All right, they're gonna give you an investment. How much do they get back? You have to pay attention to that. A number of months it'll take for your business to turn cash positive, because of course it's gonna typically be cash negative in the beginning as an investment. Uh, the measure of net profit is it called the amount of free cash flow. That's the available money after all the expenses, um, including growing the business. Next, the idea of design for the other 90%. Affordability, per acceptable customer trade-offs. So, eliminate the cost drivers, reduce the product weight, make redundancy redundant. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. No, no extraneous features. Um, reconsider the technology history. If you go back in history of many technologies, you find something very simple and elegant that sometimes can be sort of re-implemented, redeployed that might be useful. Um, something that's infinitely expandable, okay? We'll be talking about that issue a little more in chapter four. Of course, using only locally available materials. Local outsource of manufacturing. Interchangeable parts, well, there's a new idea. We're talking industrial revolution time, okay, in the 1800s. Reconsider durability, make it small, worry about the last mile delivery, task redesign, and iterate. And his claim, remember he's a psychiatrist and a business person, 25% of the problem is the design, and the rest is business. Now the thing is, there may be truth in this statement right here, for, at least for some products. I, I think they're right. I mean, you, you, because they're talking about everything from the point of having, essentially having uh, the prototype to putting it in someone's hand. And there's a lot in between there. There's manufacturing, right? There's all the marketing, distribution, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, this, this could indeed be the case. Um, okay. Uh, lots of other issues. Um, What's the price point from the customer? What will they buy things for? What are the effectiveness of trade-offs for the customer? What's a, can you produce a proof of concept prototype or a prototype for a small number of customers? And how are you gonna set up the infrastructure to get the delivery, especially the last mile? Um, and then how are you gonna put together an aspirational branding and marketing strategy that fits the culture and the environment? Um, this kind of stuff can matter so much. Just the color of a product can matter a lot. Because if the color is viewed as a negative color in a culture, which sometimes is pretty surprising what that viewpoint is, then you don't want to pick it. Um, use all available local media to promote it. Field test it. I'll field test everything. Scale up to reach millions of customers. And keep in mind the problems of going global, such as the cultural impact on your marketing strategy. Provide a vision for global business infrastructure. They call this the stakeholder-centered management. And they say that no business can thrive in the long term if in addition to pursuing a meaningful social mission, it sells high quality goods and services, pays livable wages to its employees, and avoids any harmful environment impact. That's a, that's a pretty optimistic claim in my opinion. I mean, so pick this apart. You say it can't thrive over the long term. If it doesn't have a social mission, forget about this part, and pay livable wages, and not harm the environment. I mean, there, there's so many counter examples to that statement in history, it's unbelievable. I mean, look at the big, rich companies that have been in place for many, many years that violate many of these characteristics. Okay, so. And again, the authors make these claims, and it's hard to dispute the claim because they're very tricky and they're wordy. For instance, thrive over the long term. Well, what an engineer should think of there is, oh, T goes to infinity. Nobody gives a crap about T going to infinity. I'm sorry. I care about now and so a lot of this stuff. I'm not going to wait 30 years for a, little, a livable wage. You're not going to wait 50 or 100 years 
for a livable wage. We're not going to wait 50 or 100 years to worry about environmental impact. We need to worry about those things today. So what are the lessons for the engineer? So they beat up Prahalad, who's like one of the classic guy of the field, uh, University of Michigan business professor. Um, and then they, they go ahead and later claim, we're going to succeed where he failed. Uh, in fact, we're going to succeed for a tougher case for the $2 a day person and less. Okay, they're going to have less, significantly less purchasing power, and yet they're going to succeed in creating these businesses. Okay, so they say they failed for $5 to $10. I'm going to succeed at less than $2. And they provide no justification for such a claim, period. They don't in the book. Um, the act as though zero-based design is something they invented. That's absurd. Um, it, <laughs> I mean, when you read it, it's like if you're an engineer and you understand design, you're sort of like, so what? I mean, they invented a new term. Zero-based to me is something that's used in budgeting, whereas rather than using a historical budget from year to year, you introduced a zero-based budget. You start with a new budget. You wipe the slate clean and start over. So it's sort of, uh, they're showing some naivete in, in, in terms of certainly engineering design. And they don't recognize the value of non-zero based design, it seems at all. I mean, we, you're gonna go and let's say you work for 20 years for Apple, okay? And at the beginning of the next product cycle for the iPhone 10 or 20, you say, let's forget everything we did in the past. Let's wipe the slate clean and start over completely. Do you think that's even possible? What are we gonna do, do a wipe of our brains? You're gonna throw out all of our experience over all those years? That's what they're saying, throw it all out. Completely start over. They don't seem to recognize the value of experience um, with a product at all. Or that there's not value in looking at what has happened in the developed world, but I think there is some value. Right? If you've successfully got a product going and you're selling it in the developing world, you ought to be better at selling it, changing it, and selling it in the developing world, right? You're going to have to change a lot, but you're not going to throw everything out. I mean, that's absurd. Um, I also don't, this aspirational branding thing, I, you know, so this drives me a little bit nuts. Um, as an engineer, uh, I often have a problem with the way technologies are advertised. You should be sensitive. When you see a technology advertised, and, and they say it'll do this, this, and this, you should be suspicious. Because over time, what you'll find is, is, is they bend the truth, they exaggerate, there's hype, and that's because of the aspirational nature of the branding that they want. They want you to aspire to have this thing. They want it seen as cool. So you gotta be careful with when, there's an ethical issue here at play because um, when it is that aspirational branding becomes an outright lie, okay? Now, in another sense, aspirational branding is true. You need to do that sort of thing. Just think of Coca-Cola. Who thinks of Coca-Cola and thinks, oh, that company stinks? I mean, worldwide, they've done a fantastic job of aspirational branding. In fact, they're one of the companies that's quoted as have done that very well, and it helps their business very much so. They're, you know, a lot of companies aspire to have their aspirational branding. Okay, um, so I, I think done properly and honestly, it can work. But engineers, be aware that when you hand your product off and it gets manufactured and the marketing people take over, their job is to sell as many of those as possible. And they may be bending the truth without you knowing it. You know? and I've had this personal experience with this, not just in consumer products, but in my lab. When we, we buy some uh, motor and it's supposed to perform this way. And it's crucial that it does, and we spend a fair amount of money. And it doesn't. It simply doesn't. It doesn't hit, hit the specs in any way. Okay? And we waste money. Next. They call for global solutions. They want to hit 100 million people. They want to hit many countries. They want to go big. So the question, if you make a product that can hit that many people, usually what you're doing in engineering is, is you're not meeting perfectly local needs. Okay, in some products. 
Now, another products that may work, I mean, like water. Everybody needs clean water. That's obvious. But for other products that may not um, happen, and it seems to me that meeting local needs could be just fine. I mean, there, so there's around 15 million people in Guatemala. What would be wrong with introducing a product in Guatemala and getting it to work and putting it in the hands of 15 million people? These guys said, don't bother. Remember, it's 100 million people they're going for. Don't bother. That's a waste of your time. I mean, seriously, throw it out. I don't buy that. I, I just can't buy that. So my, but my biggest concern is, um, so the experience with large social business, microfinance, this creates a lot of important ethical considerations. So if there were problems, like they highlight in their book, with microfinance institutions cheating, essentially, according to the social business model, then why won't that happen for what they're proposing, these huge corporations, okay, $10 billion profit a year, why won't that happen for them? I, I don't understand it. They don't address that issue. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, let's say you're a big company, you're selling clean water worldwide, okay? Um, how exactly would the following work? Let's say, how could you deny clean water product or service to a mother who could not pay for it for her hungry and thirsty children? And you got this, you got a vision, this happened, this stuff happens, you got the press. The press is filming this. The company is saying, nope, sorry mom and kid fall down because they're so famished. And it hits, it hits world news. It hits CNN, it hits the, all the news outlets. So this is a little bit of a concern because uh, a lot of people would get really torqued off about selling water for a profit because a lot of people say it's a basic human right. Look in the UN Declaration on Human Rights. It's there. Um, this is, and you say, well, come on, that's not gonna happen. I don't know. I mean, do you remember how the pharmaceutical companies invented the antiretrovirals for AIDS and so forth? Oh, they took the heat in the beginning because they went to the developing world and they started selling at a high cost. It was out of the reach, people, most people. And everybody's screaming at it, you evil. They're like, we had all our development costs. Come on, we got to recover. And they ended up bringing it down. But, <laughs> you know, these companies got a black eye over that. So what do these companies know now? Do you think a company really wants to get into this kind of a mess? I mean, you're talking, it's a multinational corporation. You, they're not stupid. They got an image that could be major tarnished by an event, one event, one woman with her child, and this happens, wow, they look like crap. Yes? I think this actually happened, it wasn't with clean water, it was with water as a utility. Um, and I think it was in, it was somewhere in Latin America, but I want to say Colombia, mm -hmm. and the government outsourced it to some, I, I think it was an American or a Canadian company, and they raised the rates by like a quarter, and then all hell broke loose, and they were like, I think they called them the water riots, because nobody could pay for water anymore, and they had to like, choose between feeding their family or, you know, letting their family drink water. So that actually has happened several times. This is going to happen. It's obvious it's going to happen, right? How can you control the double bottom line? That's the fundamental problem. It's free market capitalism. How can you say to someone, no, you can't make that much profit. You've got to be a nice guy. Capitalism is not about being a nice guy. Let's get real. It is about making money. It's about being competitive and tough. It's one of the reasons it succeeds, right? And how do you ask these people not to do that? Well, that's what's being happen, happening in this field. And it, I think it is working in many, many cases. Don't get me wrong. But it's the way they're saying it that bothers me the, the, the most, okay? Um, next. But there is a potential to save the poor money with low product, low cost products and services. This is an important point. Prahalad says it better than Pollock and Warwick, actually. He talks about how you're respecting the poor by selling them products. You're giving them choice. You're paying attention to them. You're selling them what they need. And if you can do it at the right price point, it makes a lot of sense. Pollock and Warwick are not nearly as eloquent as Prahalad making this point. And it's a good point, really. Um, so that's really a strong argument for getting products to the poor. Um, 
But the problem is, is if they, if Pollock and Warwick's just big businesses get in place, well, you know, if there's a need, often it's being met to a certain extent. So aren't they just going to kill all the little businesses? Yeah, come on, there, it's going to happen. They're going to kill a ton. So are they going to add jobs or subtract jobs? Or are they going to shift where the jobs are at? We're going to increase the jobs in the U.S. and decrease the jobs in the developing world. It's not so clear. They don't do any analysis of any of this stuff. Okay? Um, so can we develop products and educate the locals on how to start business? Now, personally, I like this model. Um, it, it's been tried here in College of Engineering. Um, Howard Green with the aquaponics program in Chile de Honduras in Siete de Mayo. Um, and uh, you know it's not happening now, but, it, but that in the past the idea was is start a business with the technology is being deployed by Ohio State. And this may make a lot of sense. Teach people business, sell the product that you're helping them develop or working with them to develop. Okay, so that model I think um, has a lot of point, and they're going to be trying to make money. Fine, let them make money. It's a business for them. It gives them a job, right? That can be really good. Now, are you going to have it? Are you going to be an investor? Are you going to take profit from the company? That's another matter. The other thing that bothered me about the book is, is as you probably have gathered by now, I'm pretty sensitive to uh, non-engineers making comments about how to develop technology. I think I've made that abundantly clear. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, these guys, these guys are some of the worst, though. Um, so he, for instance, I'm not going to go into all the details, but here's one that particularly bothers me. They say, make redundancy redundant. Well, what that means in a product is, is don't have a backup system. You just make the system. You don't, OK? And those backup systems, well, what they're for, engineers don't just throw something into a product for the heck of it. Of course, it's there for a reason. Usually what a, a backup system is there for is to handle safety factors, okay? And uh, so what they're saying is eliminate safety factors. Holy cow, you, these guys are, they're not engineers, period, okay? Uh, you just don't do it because why do you have those factors? Well, this is what's called design in the face of uncertainty. The civil engineers, they go and they design a bridge, they take their, their the strengths of the materials needed or whatever, and they multiply by some factor. It's a safety factor. In electrical engineering, you do this for various circuits for safety factors. This is done all over engineering. Okay, um, why? It's to protect the public. All right. So remember, engineering ethics hold paramount safety, health, and welfare of the public. This is highly irresponsible to dump this stuff. You cannot just produce unsafe products just because they're poor people. I mean, sorry, you can't do it. You can't ignore that issue. I mean. It's, it's paramount. I mean, you can't dump that. So, and then you say, well, maybe they're talking about products that just don't matter. No, they're not. They're talking about water. I mean, so you people on your water filtration projects, you got several in the class, don't make it so that you, you don't have to have to worry about guarantees on the contaminant levels of the output. Don't add a system that will make sure you can guarantee that. Forget that. See what I'm saying? I mean, this is a big problem. This, the attitude of the book is, is problematic. So they're talking about energy, safety of a cook stove, safety of electrical system, right? Uh, talking about housing, is the thing going to fall down? Because you didn't add the redundancy to make sure it could handle a bad storm in the rainy season. Um, with respect to health, health care, look, you get the point. You, you, you don't abandon good sound engineering practice, you take it on as a challenge. I understand that cost can affect all these things. There's almost always a, a trade-off between safety and cost for many products. Not all products, but for many. And we have to acknowledge that, okay, but we have to live with it. But what, the way I look at it, it, it creates for you an intellectual design challenge. How can I make it lower cost but maintain the safety? Maintain the low contaminant level, okay? These trade-offs are the hard part of many engineering design problems, okay? Um, that is it.